Good morning, everyone. It is Saturday, February the 13th, 2021. It is currently 9.35 a.m. Central Time, and I'm coming to you live from Victory Baptist Church, located here in Ovalo, Texas. And to be honest with you, I made a really bad decision in trying to make it here to this church this morning. Uh, the roads are covered in ice. It is. It was... I, I could only drive about 40 miles an hour in, in my attempt to get here. Uh, I'm assuming the roads are only going to get worse while I'm sitting here inside this church talking with you, but I felt that I needed to do everything I could to get here this morning to do as as, as many live programs as I could to get them posted. Obviously, I'm not going to be able to be here tomorrow. We're in a winter storm warning. They're talking in blizzard-like conditions, whiteout conditions possibly up to six inches of snow, which I know sounds like nothing. My daughter from Boston was telling me last night, we got 20 inches of snow. What's six inches of snow? Just make sure you understand we are in West Texas. We're not equipped for this. We're not prepared for this. So, uh, so yeah, I made it here. I, I, at one point, um, on my way here, I stopped and turned around and then I started driving back home and I said, nope, stop, turn back around and said, I'm going to make it to the church. I'm going to turn on that microphone and I'm going to hope that I can produce something that I think is beneficial. And so that's what I'm going to do. I I hope I hope that uh, I made look, I don't know if I made the right decision, but I know I made the right decision. If I can produce some things that turns out to be a spiritual blessing to someone out there, maybe there's something I'm going to say today that someone somewhere needs to hear and uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully God will bless uh, my efforts this morning. All right. Now we are going to be talking about something that's not going to be pleasant. I like. I'm not. Uh, this is going to be ugly. This is going to be messy. This is not going to be pretty. But we need to have a serious conversation. As you know, we are currently studying the book, The Christian in Complete Armor, the famous book, The Christian in Complete Armor, written by William Grinnell. We're still in chapter one, but this is a book dealing with spiritual warfare. And if we're going to talk about spiritual warfare and we're going to work our way through this book, I think it's appropriate that when something happens, you know, big within the Christian world that serves as an example of spiritual warfare and the the tragedy that can occur, that we need to then stop and talk about it. I mean, do we want to simply hurry our way through the book or do we want to really have an important conversation in regards to spiritual warfare. I think we, I hope that what you really want to have is a serious discussion about spiritual warfare. And a one, and I'm going to have a conversation in a way that a lot of people, when they talk about this subject, they, they, they sometimes, sometimes spiritual warfare, I, I think is so glamorized. We want to turn it into a movie. We want to turn it into a book when in reality, spiritual warfare is ugly. It's messy. It's horrible. Just like r- physical warfare. Physical warfare is not glamorous. Physical warfare is tragic. There is wounded people. There are people, it's just horrific. It is horrible. There is death. There is blood. It, physical warfare is a horrific horrible thing. And anyone who's ever experienced it, if they will even talk about it, they're going to tell you it's not, it's no, it's not, it's not a movie. It's not glamorous. It's not pretty. And spiritual warfare, why don't we think it's any different? Why don't we sometimes treat it like it's something, something in a movie? I don't know. It's, it's ugly. It's brutal. It's bloody. It's messy. And that's what we're going to deal with this morning. Let's begin by going to the key passage that William Grinnell is taking apart in the Christian and Complete Armor to just lay down the foundation. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, 
having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now, I just want to point out a couple of observations. One, we are, we are told that we need to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. We need the strength of God in this spiritual warfare. We need to rely on God's strength, not your strength, not my strength, but his strength. We Again, let me read it again, Ephesians 6, 10. Finally, my, uh, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. We need to be courageous. We need courage. We need strength. We need the power. That all comes from God, not from ourselves. I also think it's interesting in verse 10, finally, my brethren, we need one another. We need each other, and we, we spoke a lot about that. But we need to be strong in the Lord. We need the power of his might. That's what we need. And I want to just point out something else. Once you get down to the armor, make sure you understand that almost every item of the armor is defensive in nature, not offensive. It is there to protect ourselves, meaning and demonstrating to you and I that we are in great danger and we need protection. We need protection. Now, yes, we have the sword that we can use in a more offensive way, but primarily we need things to protect us because of the grave danger we are in. The Bible says that Satan is like a roaring lion roaming about seeking whom he may devour. We've got the world. We've got our own flesh. We've got the devil. There are so many things to come against the Christian that we have to realize it and we need all the protection we can get, all right? So I just want to keep that all in mind. Now, with all of that said, and a part of me wants to just pick up uh, the, the, the book, The Christian in Complete Armor, and start reading uh, you know, where, where we left off and just kind of jump right in, but I, I'm not going to do that. I want us to take a step back, and I want us to consider, well, a news story, a very unpleasant news story, one that's horrible to read. In fact, I have two news stories here, all right, and I want you to consider them carefully. Here's the first one. Investigation finds Ravi Zacharias. Now, if for some reason you don't know who Ravi Zacharias is, he's a, he was a very famous apologist in the Christian world. He did conferences. He spoke on, on, on uh, college, at college campuses, on university ca- uh, campuses. He, he went around the world speaking. He was well-respected. He was viewed as this great Christian apologist who was defending the faith. Many people learned so much about him. Many people claim to have come to faith in, in Jesus Christ because of his ministry. I had listened to him. He was on Christian radio all over the place. Um, very well-known. In fact, if you go to Sermon Audio, uh, as, of, as of yesterday, if you go to Sermon Audio and you type in Ravi Zacharias's name, you'll still find sermons and teachings and lectures that he did. Still, um, you know, you can find his messages all over the internet. Very well respected, very famous. Well, he passed away. And after he passed away, a lot of information started coming out. Now, to be fair, a lot of these accusations, a lot of these claims were already out there. But for some reason, many in the Christian world didn't give him much consideration, didn't do much investigating. But after he passed away, well, it seems that sooner or later, all the information started coming out. And an investigation was launched, and here's what they found. All right, here we go. Investigation finds Ravi Zacharias reportedly raped a massage therapist and sexually molested others. The late apologist Ravi Zacharias reportedly raped a female massage therapist and sexually molested several others, according to the results of a month-long investigation released today by Ravi Zacharias International Ministries. That is an investigation and a report released by the ministry itself. Not uh, from some other source, but from the ministry itself. Uh, the, The Ravi Zacharias International Board said it is shocked and grieved by Ravi's actions and feels a deep need for corporate repentance. 
Horrible story. Now, I don't, I'm not going to sit here and go through all the details. That, that doesn't accomplish anything for you and I. We could go through all the gory, horrible details and, and, and we could sit there and go, ooh, I can't believe he did that and I can't believe he did that. And we can just gossip and slander about him. Now, obviously, those details need to be released to authorities and I, you know, whatever legal ramifications can be done can be done. Obviously, Ravi Zacharias has passed, so there's nothing that can be done towards him. But if the ministry uh, covered up things, and did anything, did, you know, did not listen to the victims, treated the victims in a wrong, whatever the case may be, then that information obviously needs to be released to the legal authorities for whatever action to be taken. But just for you and I to go through all the dirty details, that's that's just more for our own curiosity than it is for any uh, benefit. But we, we see this huge scandal. It's being reported now by NBC News. It's, it's being reported by the secular media. It's horrible. It's tragic. Um, I've seen Christians go from, you know, denying all of it, saying it's not true, as if somehow I guess they've done an investigation that the ministry didn't, um, to I, I've seen everything. I, I've seen, I, you know, straight up condemnation. Oh, he wasn't a believer. Um, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a thing that a lot of Christians love to do. When, when, when someone in Christianity commits some horrible act, then a lot of Christians just say, hey, look, he wasn't a believer. That has nothing to do with Christianity, has nothing to do with us. We wash our hands of it. Again, Christians would have done the same thing to Peter, who denied Jesus three times. Oh, he was never a believer anyway. Uh, forget him. Oh, oh, David. No, 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 no. He was never a believer. You know, Solomon. No, he was never. We, we would just, we, we always want to distance ourselves. Why? Because it's ugly. It's, it's messy. It's embarrassing. It's shameful. We don't like that. So we want to get our way, uh, get uh, as far away from it as possible. But let me make it very clear. Spiritual warfare is always ugly. It's always messy. It's always bloody, just like physical warfare is. When you read a story about Ravi, like, like this about Ravi Zacharias, or you put whatever name you want to put in the story, no matter who the individual is, no matter how bad it is, no matter how big a scandal it is, what, whether you believe all the accusations, whether the accusations are, 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 are accurate or not, whatever happened, it's that is spiritual warfare in action. That's spiritual warfare right before your very eyes. That's what it looks like. It's messy, it's ugly, and there's going to be people who are wounded and hurt, and we have to acknowledge that and we have to deal with it. But there's the story of Ravi Zacharias. Here's another story. Came out just a, 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 a pretty close to the same time. This comes to us from NBC News. Legal loopholes allow abuse to go undetected at religious boarding schools, advocates say. At a Missouri Christian school for troubled teens, alumni say a gap in state law prevented inspections, enabling abuse to continue for decades. So we have a Christian school for troubled teens and abuse was going on for decades. Colton Schrag uh, remembers the night at the Agape boarding school when he says a staff member punched him in the face. It was late on April 20th, 20, uh, 2007, he said, and the staff at the All Boys Boarding School in so southwestern Missouri wanted him to confess that he and two other boys were going to try to run away. After Schrag, then, then 14, refused to answer their questions, he said one of the employees knocked him to the ground and the others held him face down, pressing a knee into, the, into his back and head. Once they were done, staff members took away Schrag's clothes and bedding, he said, and made him wear only a bathrobe and his boxers for two months. Schrag's adoptive parents placed him in agape, which which takes its name from the ancient Greek word Christians used to describe the love of God for humankind, agape love. So you name your school agape while you're, I guess, abusing kids. That's, that's wonderful. Uh, hoping the program would help him deal with anger issues and disobedience. The program marks itself as a Christian school that turns around rebellious boys. Shrag's parents said they were unaware of any abuse occurring at the facility. The school had promised close supervision and to redirect his anger in positive ways. But instead of the therapeutic environment, at the, uh, the school's leaders promised Shrag and 11 others who were sent uh, to Agape's children from the late 1990s up to last year, as well as four former staff members, told N NBC News they saw Agape workers hold boys down and hit them. Seven former students and staff members had assaulted them. 
Other punishments, the former students and staff members said, included forcing boy, boys to stare at a wall for hours, limiting meals to peanut butter sandwiches, and requiring students to haul rocks outside from one pile to another. Now, you can, you can read, I mean, this story is long. You can go through all the different things that took place. And, and, and I mean, it, there's, there's account after account after account, and it's ugly. It's horrible. And then, of course, you've known and we've seen the stories about children being sexually molested. Uh, that, that has happened in the Roman Catholic Church. It happened in Southern Baptist Convention had their own uh, a, a report come out about sexual abuse of children. Independent Fundamental Baptists have had it. It's, I mean, look, anytime you turn around with, and you look within the Christian world, you find scandals, financial scandals, sexual scandals, abuse scandals. You have all kinds of scandals where people fall, and Ravi Zacharias is just another name to add to that long, sad, horrible list. And all of that failure, all of that pain, all of that suffering is simply evidence of a spiritual war that people are in, and we have to acknowledge that. The problem is, I think many Christians, their response to these kinds of things is not biblical, it's not spiritual, it's not helpful, and it definitely does not lead to helping people move forward. And it, it, it doesn't do a lot in preparing people and how to deal with these kinds of issues. I think a lot of Christians are not really equipped in how to deal with these issues. And then whenever someone big falls, then we, we just kind of we just kind of say, well, you know, no one's perfect. Sin happens. And okay, let's all move on. But we don't really take any serious look in the mirror and say, what can we really learn from this? What are some concrete things we can learn from this? And if we're going to talk about spiritual warfare, this is an opportunity to really talk about it. All right. So I just wrote down a couple of notes. And I hope you will listen to these. I've got four points that I want you to consider. All right. Four points that I want you to consider. But I want to read a section from the Christian and Complete Armor that we've already studied, all right? Let me go back to this, all right? This is very important. And if you remember earlier on in chapter one, William Grinnell and the Christian and Complete Armor gave some things that every Christian must be engaged in. Uh, that the reason we need the power of God, the reason we need to be strong, the reason we need courage is there are certain things every Christian should be engaged in. And the third thing he gave, I think, five, a list of five things. And the third thing he mentioned, I don't know if you remember, the third thing he mentioned that every Christian must be engaged in was this. The Christian must keep on his way to heaven in the midst of all the scandals that are cast upon the ways of God. Now, he says these scandals are cast upon the way of God by the apostasy and foul falls of false professors. Now, I think that's not helpful because, again, it's like, hey, those people who fall, they're false professors. They're false professors. So what this does is create an environment that anyone who falls into serious sin, oh, well, they were just lost. They're not a, they're not a Christian. And, and we just kind of wash our hands of them and move on. That, to me, is not the biblical approach. When someone falls, there's got to be someone who walks up to them and gets down there in the mud and the mire with them saying, God loves you. There is forgiveness. The blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse you from all sin. And try not, and we don't need to be the people standing there with rocks ready to throw. We got to get there in the mud and mire to help pick someone up. That is a part of Christian warfare. But what we have a tendency to do, you see that woman over there caught in adultery? Well, even if you, I, I may not throw a rock at her, but she was probably not saved anyway. Let's just forget about her and move on. We cannot have that mindset. You don't know if someone is saved. You don't know if someone's not saved. You cannot see into a person's heart. You're, you're not, you don't have, you know, getting information from the throne of God where God is telling you, oh, that one is, that one isn't. You don't know. You, you, what you have to find, are you trusting in Jesus Christ? Are you trusting in his finished work on the cross? If they say yes, then treat them as a Christian and then do what we can to help them. But what we want to do is, ooh, 
man, that person messed up. Okay, let's get as far away from them as possible. Oh, that's going to make me look bad. Oh, that's going to make us look bad. Let's get as far away from them as possible. Let's cut ties. Let's wash our hands. Let's not look in their direction. Let's not make eye contact. Come on, kids, let's move on past them because that person is a failure. And that's what we love to do. And that is that cannot be our approach. Anytime someone makes a, a horrible sin and it's a public scandal, well, you know, they, sorry, let's move on. And that's what happens many, in many cases. Someone commits a horrible sin and then everyone's just like, well, never liked them anyway, thought they were garbage anyway, didn't like their preaching anyway, let's all move on. And then you just leave that person laying there. Jesus did not leave the woman caught in adultery. He went to her, right? He, he was there. He talked to her. He didn't say, okay, guys, let's get up and move on. Let's, let's move on. No, those are the, it's the sick who needs the medicine. It's the wounded who needs the bandaging. It's, the, it's those who are hurt and wounded who need someone there. And we talked about that in great detail. But I just want to remind you that in the Christian in complete armor, his, his approach is, hey, they're false professors. But he does make a good point. We must keep our way to heaven in the midst of all the scandals. There were scandals then. There's going to be scandals now. There will be scandals in the future. We've got to know how to continue to march on our way to heaven, how to continue to fight the spiritual war in the midst of scandal. So here's the points I want us to, and and I could read uh, a lot more here, but he really goes after this idea that they're false professors. That's, That's really the way he goes. And I just disagree with that mindset. I, I just, I just disagree that that cannot be the way we always conduct ourselves. I, I think sometimes we, we want to call those people who fall. We want to call them false professors. Listen to me for our benefit. We want, we do it for our own peace of mind. We do it for our comfort. We do, we do it to make it easy for us. We, we want to do, deal with it because it makes it easy when, when some lost person says, hey, look at that Christian over there who committed sin. Well, they're probably not a Christian anyway. It makes it easy for us to, to not have to deal with the ugliness of it. We don't, spiritual warfare is not fought in such a way that we only do things, we, we do everything with ourselves in mind. Spiritual warfare is not about what makes life easy for us. What makes us comfortable? That's not the way we engage in it, right? But here are some points I want you to consider. Number one, in a previous study, I told you about uh, the idea of battlefield medicine, and I really emphasize that. And And I'll just briefly mention this, but I want to expand it. Yes, we need spiritual warfare cannot be conducted without battlefield medicine. People need medics. You need to be a medic. You need to have your medical bag ready to go. And when you see someone falling, you see someone broken, you see someone bleeding, you see someone in horrible, I mean, they, they, they've just, they've been just cut down and it's ugly. You got to run there with your medical kit, rip it open and get your hands bloody and trying to help them and trying to, to, to do what you can to, it, to restore them back to a position of usefulness. You need, we need spiritual people with medical kits right there in the war, ready to run in and ready to help and bandage people up. I'm going to just look here really quick because I think it's an important story. Give me one second. Um, yes. We'll go to uh, John chapter 8. We'll go to John chapter eight, John chapter eight. Now, there are those who claim that this story doesn't belong in the Bible because it's not in many manuscripts, but it's in most of our Bible. So I'm going to read it and treat it as if it's there. And uh, there's some important lessons to be gained here. John chapter eight, verse one. Jesus went out into the Mount of Olives and early in the morning, he came again into the temple and all the people came unto him and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taking an adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? 
This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down with his finger, wrote on the ground as though he had heard them not. Now let's stop right here. Now, please note. There's always those within Christianity that when someone falls into sin, they really don't care about the person who fell into sin. Here, look, these the Pharisees, these men who caught this woman in the very act, they didn't care about adultery. They didn't care about her. They obviously didn't care. I mean, if she was caught in the very act, where was the man? They didn't care. Well, was the man a Pharisee? Was, was, was he a friend of theirs? Who knows? But the man is nowhere to be found. The woman is, all right? The woman is there. But please note, there's always going to be those people within Christianity. When someone falls, they use someone's failure as an opportunity to try to attack, to try to, to try to, um, set a trap. To, they, they, they have ulterior motives. In other words, their motive is, look, this poor woman was caught in adultery. This is sin. Let's deal with this sin. Let's deal with this spiritually. No, no, no. They're like, this is an opportunity. This is an opportunity to advance our goal for us to destroy someone. This is, this is our, our opportunity to attack that person. And that's what happens when a famous preacher's fall. If you don't like the famous preacher, then you're like, oh, see, I told you he was a piece of garbage. And you use it as an opportunity to attack the preacher. You don't use it as an opportunity to go, oh, man, this man fell in sin. What can we do to help him? What can we do to help those who are hurt by him? What can we do to, to equip, to, to restore such a one? No, you don't care about restoring. You care about destroying. When you, someone falls into sin, what do you do? Do you see it as an opportunity to pray, to help? To be that medic, or do you look as an opportunity? Oh, ho, 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 ho. I didn't like that person. All right, let me hop on social media so I can talk about them. Let me post some things on the internet. Let me go. Let me go here and ask some questions about the person because I want to hurt them. That's what. That's what some Christians do. They have this same mindset. Oh, they don't care about the woman. They don't even care about adultery. They care about the opportunity to attack someone, the opportunity to destroy someone. You, we've got to check our own attitudes when someone falls into sin. Now, if it's a preacher we love, then we're ready to come out defending them. Now, we're more worried about defending them than, again, restoring them. It's, it's just crazy. When, when someone falls, we, we go to gossip. We go to slander. We go to condemnation. We go to using it for our own advantage. Our, our, our way of handling sin is so broken. Spiritual warfare has to involve the idea that Christians know how to handle when someone falls, and it requires battlefield medicine. Your job is to bandage. Your job is to cover. Your job is to restore. Your job is not gossip and slander. All right? And you say, well, I don't know the person. All right, then stop talking and start praying. There's no need to talk about it. There's no need to air out all the dirty details. Now, I am not saying we don't air out the dirty details to to the authorities so that actions can be taken, especially if illegal action was taken place. But it's not your job to go spread it everywhere. What are you hoping to accomplish? Christians don't know how to handle scandal. We don't. We, 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 we're no better than the world. We, we use it for selfish motives. We, we want to destroy. We want to hurt. We want to gossip. We want to slander. It's just... That's not the way we should conduct ourselves. Again, I am not saying cover it up to the authorities. If illegal activities were done, that's got to be reported to the authorities, not reported to all your friends, but get it to the authorities so that an investigation can be done. And that if, if illegal actions were done, then legal, then legal actions can be taken. If it's not illegal and it's just moral, then you've got to handle that in a correct way way. So we need battlefield medicine. But let's continue here um, in, in John chapter 8. I just think it's crazy the way, that, hey, here's a woman caught in the very act. They don't bring the man, they bring the woman. And look what they're doing. And I love the way it says, they, this they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. They're using someone's failure as an opportunity to accuse Jesus. We don't use people's failure as an opportunity. It's not an opportunity. It's an opportunity to do right. It's not an opportunity to do wrong and to try to trap someone. But Jesus stooped down 
with his finger and he wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and he said unto them, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground, which, and they which heard it being uh, convicted by their own conscience went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the, uh, and the woman standing in the midst. All right. So here's all the men. They, whatever Jesus wrote on the ground, whatever happened there, they become convicted. Again, maybe it, the man who was involved was, was, you know, maybe it was one of the Pharisees. Maybe it was one of the scribes of the Pharisees. I don't know. But it's just interesting. The man is not there. Does he write his name down? Does he keep writing his name down? And they realize, uh-oh, he knows what we, we've done, that we've used this as an opportunity to trap him. And they're convicted. Does he begin to write down sins that he knows they had committed? I don't know. But that's, it's just a, that's another good. So the first principle is when someone falls into sin, hey, listen, do not use it as an opportunity to do bad. Don't use it as an opportunity to hurt and destroy and kill and slander. And no, use it as an opportunity to restore. Use it, at, care actually about the people involved. Care about the sin that actually occurred. And here's another thing. When, and, and these are not even the principles I've written down, but I just wanna go through John 8 for a reason. You'll see that in a minute, okay? So listen to me carefully. Another thing we learned from John chapter eight, very important, is that we have to be very careful that when other people sin, we we use, we, we let, me, let me state it this way. We have to be very careful that when we see other people sin, that we don't forget our own sin. See, when other people sin, it's great to start talking about their sin. And while you're sitting there pointing all your fingers at their sin and you're ta- uh, t- you know, tapping, uh, tapping away on your mobile device to post whatever you want on social media about the person, while you're doing all that talking about them, you better realize that maybe nobody knows, but you've got some skeletons in your own closet. You say, well, I never committed that sin, but you've got your own sin. You're not without sin. You're not without it. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't condemn sin. It doesn't mean that we don't expose sin. It doesn't mean that we don't confront sin. We just always, whenever we confront sin, we have to realize that we are coming at that with dirty hands ourselves because we all have sin, right? But this is what I really wanted to get to. The woman is left standing there. And when Jesus had lifted up himself, and he saw none but the woman. He said unto her, "He said unto her, woman, where are those? Where are those? Where where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee?" So Jesus is like, "Where where are all your accusers? Did no one condemn you? Where do they all go?" She said, uh, "She said, no man, Lord." And Jesus said unto her, "Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin." No more. Jesus shows mercy. Jesus shows compassion. Jesus shows forgiveness. Now, yes, he does say go and sin no more. He does say go and sin no more. He's he's not saying, hey, just go do what you want. He is saying, now go, go and live a correct life. But there is mercy. There is grace. Even for a woman caught in adultery, there is mercy and grace. There is mercy and grace at the foot of Je- at the foot of the cross, uh, at the feet of Jesus. There is mercy and grace, and we must never forget that. We've got to go to people and say, "Look, in Jesus Christ, there is forgiveness. In Jesus Christ, all your sins can be forgiven. Get up and go and so- sin no more. Restore them." We have to be the ones to restore them. So let me go through my principles here. And so number one, we need battlefield medicine. And I just read John 8 just to really emphasize that. We need battlefield medicine. And battlefield medicine involves a right way of thinking about failure. We, we, we're the medic. We run to it. And sometimes we need the medic. But, but here I want to expand this idea because we've talked about this before, but I want to expand it. We need battlefield medicine for the victims. Now, listen to me carefully. When I say victims, I'm talking victims of sexual abuse, 
victims of sexual harassment, victims of physical abuse, okay? I'm talking about people who are victims, not people who are involved in a consensual, inappropriate relationship when you're two consenting adults. I'm talking about people who are abused, people who are, you know, you know, a, a rape, a child molestation, harassment, uh, when, when intimidation, uh, blackmail. When, when, when things are, you know, th- when threatened, if you do this, we'll sue you. Uh, all these horrible things that, that have happened within, within Christianity. We, sometimes what we do is like with the Ravi Zacharias story. Everyone will focus on Ravi and how messed up he was, and everybody will gossip and slander and post all of their things on the internet. But where, where, where are the victims? Where are the victims? Where are the victims? I've seen some Christians already question the trustworthiness of the victims, call them into question. The one thing society has learned a lot, and whether, whatever your views on the Me Too movement is, is that the Me Too movement has tried to make it clear that victims have to be treated in a dignified and respectful way. Now, listen, I understand that anyone can make any accusation. I understand that. And sometimes someone makes an accusation that has maybe 60% truth, and then there's a lot of things in there that are misrepresented. And that, that always calls some, then other victims into question. But we, when someone is a victim and it, it's proven that they are a true victim, then listen, they, we've got to care about the victim as well. Sometimes we want to, we just want to, we want to forget about the victim because we're so worried about the offender that we forget the victim. Look, the, the victim needs, the, 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 the person who committed the wrong They need battlefield medicine. We can't forget them as well. No matter how horrible a thing that they've done, they need battlefield medicine. That person who committed a horrible, horrible sin, rape, molesting of a child, if they claim claim to be a Christian, they still need battlefield medicine. Now, that doesn't mean we excuse it. That doesn't mean we cover it up. No, legal action has to be taken. But while they're sitting in their their, uh, prison cell, they still need battlefield medicine to restore them back to hopefully a right relationship with God and hopefully getting them the help they need. Not excusing it, not covering it up, not saying, hey, you abused 10 children. Now, once you get restored, we're going to put you back there working with children. I'm not saying that. You got to, I got to be very careful with what I say because people always misunderstand this. Battlefield medicine is not excusing. Battlefield medicine is is patching up, dealing with the, the the mess, the blood, the horrific details, dealing with it and trying to help someone. But we can't forget the victims as well. Now, sometimes you may be the person who's going to be close to the victim and you do everything you can to minister to that victim, to pick them up, to protect them, to cover them. Sometimes you're the the one who's close to the person who committed the act. Well, then you do everything you can to to patch them up, not excusing what they did, not covering up what they did if there's legal implications, but you're there to try to to patch them up to the best of your ability. Battlefield medicine has to be for the person who committed the wrong and for the victims of the wrong. If if we're talking about victims as people who are abused, all right? Again, sometimes you have two two consenting, consenting adults involved in an inappropriate relationship. Well, then both of them committed wrong and both of them need to be, both of them need to be uh, bandaged and, and, and fixed up. Sometimes, uh, John chapter eight shows this. Sometimes it's really weird. Um, someone will commit a wrong And it's like, okay, that person, it's like two, it takes two. It takes two to be involved in the wrong, but all the focus is on the one and the other one, nobody, nobody says anything about. No, it takes two. It takes two. And sometimes we always say, well, that one, that one is more responsible. Well, maybe that one's more responsible and you can get into some discussion and and get your, your bar graph and try to figure out this one bears 60% of the responsibility. This one bears 40% of the responsibility. You can, you can try. But in, in, in many cases, it's two consenting adults involved in an inappropriate relationship, and both knew the relationship was wrong going into it, all right? Now, it's one thing if, if, if one person holds power over the other person, right? I like it. 
he's the boss, she's the employee, and he held power over her, and she felt that if she didn't do this or that, that she could get fired, she could lose her job, she could withhold money. If someone holds a position of power over someone, then yeah, there's greater responsibility. But if there's no position of power at all, okay, then we sometimes... I, I just think sometimes we look for we look for the one person to blame and we let the other person go. Everyone involved, everyone involved, the people and the people carrying it out, the victims, everyone involved. Listen, they all have to be held responsible. Not not a victim as far as you know someone who was raped or abused. Okay, so not a victim in that way. But everyone involved, everyone involved, they need battlefield medicine. Let's state it that way. Some people, yes, have to be held accountable for their actions, and that involves discipline, maybe legal action. That, that's in a, a situation where they committed a crime, sexual abuse, molestation. You understand that. There's other situations where you have two parties involved. They were involved in a, a, a consensual relationship or involved in whatever, whatever the action may be because we always turn it to sexual sin. There's lots of different kinds of sin, okay? But whoever was involved— Listen, that in some cases both need to be held accountable, both need to be confronted, both may need some form of discipline, and both need battlefield medicine. Discipline is one thing, medicine is another. You sometimes you need a little of both. Sometimes you need a little of both. But we need battlefield medicine for the victims. And I just think sometimes the victims get forgotten. The victims get forgotten. It's like in the, you know, uh, you know, if, if there's children who were abused by a pastor, it's like, man, okay, what are we going to do? We got it. We 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 all want to move forward, but what about the victims who were abused as a child for two years, three years, four years by a youth director or a pastor? What about the victims? Now I know it's very hard because in many cases those victims have turned away from the faith. They're now atheists. They're now agnostics, and there's no way to to really help them, and that's very difficult. But we need to at least show love, compassion, and victims need to be treated with respect and dignity when they bring a, an accusation. They got to be treated with, with some kind of respect that, okay, you made this accusation. And if the accusation approves to be true of abuse, of rape, or whatever, then it needs to be investigated correctly. Right? I just think sometimes victims get overlooked. So we need battlefield medicine for the victims. Number two. Oh, this one's going to be controversial. We have to change the predominant teaching in the Christian church about the Christian life. We have to change the predominant teaching in the Christian church about the Christian life. And that predominant teaching is this. And I know I'm going to make some people mad, but look, at some point you got to face reality. Here's the constant teaching within much of the Protestant church. And it goes something like this. When you become a Christian, You've become a new creature in Christ. Old things are passed away. All things have become new. And we preach that in a practical way. That in other words, you've become a new creature in a practical way. The old is completely gone. And now you have the power of God. You're free from the bondage of sin. So now you have the power to live a godly life. And that therefore you can live a godly life. And we speak of this power and now we have this strength and we now have this ability. We preach it that way. This is a predominant teaching in the Christian faith. And then guess what we discover? We keep sinning and we keep sinning and we keep sinning. So, so then you have to ask yourself, well, wait a minute. Am I completely a new creature and the old is completely gone? Is that true practically? Because why do I keep sinning if the old is gone? Well, the old is gone, but you're still going to struggle. Well, wait a minute. If the old is completely gone and I have the power and I've been set free from the bondage of sin, then I should be able to be perfect. Well, I mean, you have the power and you can live the Christian life, but you're never going to do it perfectly. So then how much power do I have? We never really deal with this issue. I've dealt with this idea that if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, things are new. If you go look at the context there, that is the way we view a a person who comes to faith in Christ. We view them as a new creature because positionally, they are a new creature. Positionally, before God, the old is gone. Before God, positionally, they are now holy. They are now considered obedient. Because the obedience of Christ is imputed to their or, or is accredited to their account, imputed to their account. They are forgiven. 
That is true positionally. Practically, practically in their everyday life, they still have flesh. They still have a sinful nature. They're still going to struggle with sin. They're still going to sin on a regular and consistent basis. But we teach it, we, we, we hype it up that now you've been set free. You have the supernatural power in you. You can obey God. You can now live for him. You can now keep his law. No, you can't. You're going to keep sinning. And we, and because we teach it this way, when people fall into sin, then we don't know how to process it. So what do we run to? Well, they were never saved because if they were saved, they could never do that because they have the power of God to keep them from doing that. When are you going to realize people keep sinning? Now you may pat pat yourself on the back and go, but hey, 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 I've never committed that sin, but you've got plenty of your own. Maybe it's not a sexual sin. But you've got an issue with submission. You've got an issue with gossip and lying and slander. You've got an issue of not loving your enemy. I mean, you've got you've got issue after issue inside your own heart and your own mind and in your own life. When are we going to realize that people are going to continue to sin? If we tell everyone you have some supernatural power and you've been set free and now you don't have to sin, at some point people become very discouraged because we keep sinning. And if we have this mindset there, then when people sin, we don't know how to process it. Here's the reality. Positionally before God, you stand before God positionally, perfectly holy, perfectly righteous, perfectly obedient, and perfectly forgiven. Why? Because of Christ's imputed righteousness to your account. That means you are declared righteous You are considered righteous. You are not righteous. You are considered righteous because the the righteousness of Christ is accredited to your account. But you're still ungodly. You're still a sinner who still lives in the flesh, who's still going to struggle. We sell it the wrong way, and then we live with the consequences of giving people all of this kind of false hope and false idea. And it's devastating to people's Christian life. It, it's great the first 15 minutes. You're like, whoo, I'm a Christian now. I'm a new creature in Christ. Old things are passed away. I've got power. I can live for God. I can keep his law. And for f- the first 15 minutes, it's great. Try being a Christian for 15 years. Either you have to constantly live in a state of denial where you're denying the reality of your own sin and trying to be fake and basically covering your, your, your life in fig leaves to try to make yourself look good when in reality you're corrupt inside but you won't admit it because you don't think you can admit it because you, you're supposed to have all of this power or you begin to acknowledge the reality and you realize the reality doesn't correspond with that teaching so then you become discouraged thinking that Christianity really doesn't work. That's all devastating. Understand there is a positional reality and there's a practical reality. The positional reality is one thing. The practical reality is you're still a sinner with a sinful nature. You're going to fall and you're, in, you're involved in a serious battle against the world, the flesh, and the devil. And you need all the protection you can get and you're going to fall. And that's why we need medics. That's why we need battlefield medicine. All right. So number one, battlefield medicine for victims. Number two, we have to change the predominant teaching in the Christian church about the Christian life. And that teaching is that somehow you have power, you've been set free, and now you can keep the law of God. I don't know how many times I hear this in preaching. I don't know how many times I read it in Christian books. And it's just complete garbage. You're going to fall. You're never going to be able to keep the law of God perfectly, ever. The law of God, you keep the law of God in your position in Christ because he kept it for you. Now, this doesn't excuse sin. It's just we have to acknowledge the reality that sin is always going to be present with us, in us. It's going to be present in our life. It's going to be present in our church. So therefore, we need battlefield medicine. Number three, we need a climate of confession. What do I mean that with that? With, and we need churches where people can openly confess their struggles and their weaknesses and their failures without getting 18 rocks thrown at them. Now, I'm not saying you stand up in the middle of church and say, hey, God, listen, everyone, last night I spent three hours watching pornography. I'm not saying that it's, that's the time to do so, but there needs to be a place where people can come to say, hey, 
I'm having problems. Hey, I'm struggling. Hey, I have an issue. There's got to be an openness there. But people are afraid to confess anything. So we put on this fake righteousness to make everyone think that we're doing great when in the reality we're not doing so great because everyone's afraid to confess anything because you're going to be condemned and then everyone's going to start gossiping about you and slandering you. It's just like many kids who are real reality struggling with some kind of issue. Maybe it's uh, they're involved in premarital sex and that they're afraid to tell anyone. Maybe they're, maybe they're going to parties and starting to drink. Maybe they, they've tried marijuana. Whatever the case may be, you know what they're afraid to do? They're afraid to tell their parents because they're afraid they're going to get yelled at. They're afraid they're going to get grounded. So what do they do? They keep it a secret and try to deal with it themselves. I don't think the church has ever been a, a, a has I don't think the church has ever been very good at creating an environment where people can be open and honest with their weakness and their struggles. Now I don't think we sit there and say, "Hey, it's okay, uh, you know, go do it." I think no, but there's got to be a place. The church has to be an environment where you can confess anything. There's got to be that within Christianity. Where people are not going to immediately hit you with a rock. We can say, man, okay, all right, we got to help you here. What can we do? And sometimes all you can do is just listen to their struggle. Sometimes all you can do is pray for them. Sometimes all you can do is try to help them. But sometimes the first step in helping them is allowing them the freedom to confess whatever it is, no matter how bad it may be. I've received phone calls in the past from people confessing things that were, I'm like, whoa. But you know what? I'm glad they could call and confess it. I'm, I've never, t- I don't tell people what they confess. I don't share with what they confess. I don't, don't, and it's just weird that sometimes people feel they have to call someone they listen to on the internet to confess because they don't feel like they can confess it to anybody else. But there's got to be a place you can confess it. Look, I'll, I, I, people say, well, all I have to do is confess it to God. Yeah, but James says we need to confess our sins one to another. I think in, in some ways there's a beauty. Now, listen to me. I'm not saying the theology of it, but the practice of the Catholic system of someone being able to walk into a confessional booth and pour out their hearts of everything they've done. There is something, I think, therapeutic and powerful about that. I mean, there's some issues with the theology of it. We don't do that in the Protestant world. Everybody just puts on their, you know, their suit and tie and their, their nicest dress. And we come to church and we say, amen, how you doing? Oh, I'm blessed. Everything's wonderful. And, and the reality is we're, we're not being honest with what's really going on. Hey, no, to be honest, my marriage is falling apart. To be honest, me and my wife got in a huge fight and I, 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 I hit her. To be honest, I got very upset with my kids yesterday and I threw something across the room and I smashed it. That's not the way a Christian home should be. Yesterday, I got mad at my wife and I, and I cussed her out. We're, we're, that, that's, the rea- that's spiritual warfare. That's the reality. It's ugly. It's messy because we're all sinners. But if we cannot confess that, if there's no openness about it, then there can't be any help. It's the same thing with going to a counselor. Counseling is of no value if you're not open and honest with the reality of what you're doing and what you're thinking and what's going on. If you go in there to tell the counselor, you create your own little narrative so the counselor sees you as as the victim and that you convince them that, hey, this is the way it really is. You're not going to get any help. You've got to be willing to go to that counselor and tell them the good, the bad, the ugly, the dirty, the the thing that nobody knows. You've got to tell them the reality. And sometimes then that they can say, whoa, okay, you're messed up. Let's get you some help. All right. And then lastly, number uh, four, we need a broken humility, or I'll state it this way. A broken humility needs to dominate our lives. We need a broken humility. And when I say broken, we need to be, we always need to operate from a state of being broken. We are broken because we're constantly, we constantly realize that practically in my everyday life, positionally, I'm covered in the blood of Christ. I'm, I'm covered in the righteousness of Christ. But practically every day, you know what I need to say? Woe is me, I'm undone. I'm an, I am an unclean man, unclean lips, unclean thoughts, unclean actions. Woe is me, woe is me. We need to be constantly broken over the reality that we are still sinners and my only hope is the finished work of Jesus Christ. 
We need a, and that should bring about a humility inside of us. We need this mindset. Go to uh, the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, verse 9. Luke chapter 18, verse 9, speaking of Jesus. He spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are. Lord, I, I thank you that I'm not like Ravi Zacharias. Lord, I thank you I'm not like David. Lord, I thank you. Because we just convince ourselves of how good we are. Right? That I'm not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. So we, we're very good at, at convincing ourselves we're not like everyone else. We're not like everyone else. We're not like that, those people in the world. We are sinners just like the people in the world. We're, we are frail sinners. You say, but I'm a new creature in Christ. Positionally, you are, not practically. Practically, you're still a sinner with a sinful nature. But you convince yourself that you're so good. You convince yourself that you're godly. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And now look at verse 13. This is what we need to be like. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up as much as his eyes into heaven, but smote upon his breast saying, God, Be merciful to me, a sinner. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. We need to confess that continually. I'm a sinner. And we need to confess it to the world. We are sinners. We fall. We fall continually. We're not better than you. In our practice, yes, we strive to live a more godly life. We strive to avoid and to to not do the things that some of you do in the world, but we are not better. We are simply covered in the blood of Jesus Christ. We're covered in his righteousness. When I stand before God, it's not because I'm somehow better than you practically. I'm gonna stand before God because I am perfect in Jesus Christ. My salvation is in Christ, not in what I can do. But we, 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 we mess this all up. We're not very gospel minded sometimes. We got to think differently about failure. We got to think differently. We need battlefield medicine. So let me go through these again and I'll end. The Christian in complete armor. Yes, just remember the armor is mostly defensive, not offensive, because we need protection, because we're in a war. We have the story of Ravi Zacharias. We have the story of the Agape Christian School in Missouri. And I could just pull out article after article, article of stories. There's always one somewhere. So what do we need to learn to this? We need battle, you can remember John chapter eight, uh, but mainly what I want you to remember is battlefield medicine for victims, for everyone. But, but for this particular case, I, w- I just wanna, the victims sometimes get overlooked and forgotten. We wanna move on past the victims because that's ugly and that's horrible to look at. And sometimes we wanna move past the person committing the horrible acts, but everyone needs battlefield medicine. Number two, we have to change the predominant teaching in the Christian church about the Christian life. The predominant teaching is, hey, you're a Christian. Guess what? Practically, practically in your everyday life, you're a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. No, that is your position. We've got to get rid of this teaching that somehow you, now you have power to keep the law of God. Now you are free from sin so that you can obey God. You're, if you believe that, you're going, to, you're going to become greatly discouraged because you're going to find yourself sinning all the time or you're going to have to start pretending that you're more godly than you really are. Actually, which will lead you to live in a state of denial about your own sinfulness. That is not a place that you want to be in. Number two, we need a climate of, or number three, we need a climate of confession. Man, the Christianity needs to be the place where people can confess. And look, I don't know who you are and I don't know where you are and I don't know what you've done, but whatever it is, if you need to confess, confess. Find someone. And we need a broken humility that needs to dominate our lives. We need to be able to say, Lord, I am a sinner. Okay, in fact, Go back to Luke chapter 18. You may want to write this phrase down. You you may want to write this phrase down. And I want you, and and you should, uh, and and, and the Catholic Church, when they do their public confession, they they do that. They they, they smite their uh, 
their, their chest, right? Because I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner, right? Okay, say, and this is what we should say every day. God, be ber- merciful to me, a sinner. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's what we should should be, that, that should be on our lips and in our mind every day. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I am a sinner. I'm going to remain a sinner until I am in your presence and not, I, am, I have a glorified body and no longer a sinful nature at then. But until then, the things I want to do, I'm not going to do. And the things I don't want to do, I'm going to end up doing. And no matter how much I dress it up, no matter how many fig leaves I go find to cover up the reality, I'm a sinner. God be merciful to me, a sinner. I am a sinner. All right. Hopefully that was beneficial. You can email me your thoughts. Newsif at yahoo.com. Newsif at yahoo.com. Newsif at yahoo.com. I wish I could have. I know there was a lot of thoughts I threw at you right there and all of that, and maybe I could have organized it better. But I, I just, if it was beneficial at all, please let me know. All right. I, I know some of you are going to be like, you should have just moved on in the book. I, I, I look, I hope I've, I've, I've given you something beneficial. Please let me know. I, I really would like to know if this was helpful at all. All right. Newsif at yahoo.com. All right. Everyone have a great day. God bless.